There we go. That's good. Thank you. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Before I get to the lesson on Ham, one of Noah's sons, I wanted to talk to you about uh, some of our missionaries today. The missionaries today are to the missionaries to the Philippines, the Donatos. I like all countries. God loves all sorts of people. But I really like the Philippines. I don't know, ever since World War II and MacArthur helping them rebuild and everything, that's just a vibrant country. And even though you don't go over there and I don't go over there, we go over there in the presence of Knapp and Shirley Donato, our missionaries to the Philippines. We've supported them since June of 2008. And they do everything. They were called as young adults to full-time service. That means teaching in elementary schools and a Christian school and a Christian Bible college. Uh, theological seminaries. I like this name, their home church, the Blessed Hope Baptist Church. Uh, we are people of the book, the blood, and the best blessed hope. I like that. So anyway, unless you have the ability to go over there and teach, the best thing you can do is support them through Faith Promise Missions, and you'll get uh, credit for getting involved in spreading the gospel throughout the Philippines. Well, go to uh, Genesis 5. We'll be in Genesis 5, 7, and 10. Uh, we're in our series, Introducing People of the Bible. We're growing, actually, toward the end of our series. Uh, this is Lesson 39. Last week, we talked about Captain Noah and the good ship Grace. Today, we're talking about one of Noah's sons, uh, Ham, and his sin. We're talking about a saved soul and a wasted life. And I'm going to encourage you not to follow them, and you'll encourage me. The Bible doesn't tell us a lot about Ham, but he tells us enough that we can get a good picture of him. He was one of Noah's sons. We'll find out he was the middle son. He was married. He had a vigorous and a brilliant family as far as topside planet Earth and horizontal living. But it also tells us that he committed a shameful sin and embarrassed his father and disrespected his father. And that's not good. Uh, Ephesians 6.1 says, uh, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Uh, honor your mother and father. That's the first commandment with promise. The promise is that thy days being long upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So you're cutting short your life. You're cutting short your influence. You're cutting short your lifeline with God when you dishonor your parents. That's true whether you're saved or whether you're lost. God passed him over, we'll see at the end of the lesson today, in favor for his youngest uh, son and his oldest son, the middle son, Ham, uh, did not receive the same blessings and really felt the full weight of the curse of God. Ham had an older and a younger brother. Uh, he was a middle child. I was the oldest. My sister got away with murder. You can quote me on that. She got away with anything because she was the baby and because she was a girl and she just got away with things. And, and I was honored, I guess, to be the older uh, son. But there's different personalities. We didn't want to overread that. But the middle child often feels left out. Look at the British Empire over there, all those whiny princes and pr princesses and all their troubles. Everybody has these things. Uh, that may be significant. Sometimes the middle child feels unimportant. They're not getting the honor and the leadership that the oldest child gets. They're not getting the less sternness that the youngest child gets. You know, if you have a lot of children, you very likely you are much more strict on the first child. Not 100%, but in a lot of families. And that baby gets away with murder. Ham's problem may have been some of that, but he sure caused his father more headaches and more heartaches than the other two boys combined. That's all it, the Bible says about him, but we can take the context today and again get a picture of Ham and his sin. Number one, when Ham lived, you say, well, is this any way relevant to our lives? It is. We talked about and we've been studying, and Mark's going to continue today in the book of the Revelation about the end times, that the end times are described as like the days of Noah and like the days of Lot. And we studied last week in the main sermon some of the ways that the end times, which we apparently are living in, quite likely, you can't be certain, are like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. They were number one like our day, a day of discovery, an age of discovery. It was an exciting and an exotic time in world history with high technology and uh, scientific discovery. You know, you start off on the farm. America was mostly a rural agrarian nation 100, 150 years ago, and now more and more people are in the cities and the communities on off the farm. Great things were happening then like they are now, 
but they were things that broke the heart of God. They, like us, were in the technological graduate school and the moral kindergarten. Number one, Ham lived and we live in an age of discovery. Number two, uh, without God's wisdom and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, all the knowledge is splendid ignorance. We live in a day of, again, high technology and low morality. The age of darkness in science and engineering and technology, those were great. I appreciate technological advances, but guess what? They don't feed the soul. Your iPhone 14 with its new camera, which that lady on the TV keeps telling us is going to change our life, won't. Now, going from no phone to a phone you can carry in your pocket may have some advantages, but every new one just has this promise on its advertisements that it's going to change your life. I don't think it will. It doesn't meet the need of the deepest part of your soul. Ham lived in a day of discovery, in an age of discovery, in an age of darkness. Uh, his day and our day was marked by an unhealthy fixation on technology because it's the things of this world. It blunts the appetite for the things of God. Ham basically lived in an age of disbelief. People in that day, like our day, prided themselves that they were no longer tied down by old concepts like Bible truth or church reality. God's truth and God's revelation then is now are either forgotten completely or laughed out of the conversation. If you bring up in a conversation at work, uh, and I, well, I wish you would, uh, cal calmly and quietly, some of the truths about the fall of man, the nature of sin, the need for righteousness, salvation, a substitutionary atonement, somebody to take the punishment due to us, uh, to divert the wrath of God from our account, the nearness of judgment, half a heartbeat from forever, people will think you're absolutely, totally wacko. And uh, that's just the, the, the way that the world is going to categorize us. After the rapture of Enoch, God had to ser search the whole planet to find one man who really believed and who really believed unto righteousness, and that was Noah. Noah was the one man in his day that would stand for God in that day and preached boldly to a lost world. Uh, Ham didn't think so, but he had a wonderful father. A lot of people who are raised in a Christian home They'll gather together and shake their head and lift their nose and talk about poor old mom and dad back on the farm and don't you wish they could move along in their life? Man, you, you better tie in close to mom and dad. Those young people are absolutely wrong. Not only did Ham live and we lived in a day of discovery and darkness and disbelief, but an, ab an age of demonism. Do you see the parallel tracks that uh, we in humanity are wrong today? We put our great faith in reason, in technology, in uh, things like that. And then also simultaneously, in contradistinction, we have a false spirituality of demons and wickedness and angels and just things that are superfluous. Rejecting God, the world before the flood, left a great vacuum in the hearts of people. Uh, people that will not reject and worship, people that reject and will, will not worship God will worship anything, and they do. Uh, nature abhors a vacuum. I do that all the time, little skin surgery. You take out a big cyst or drain it, everything looks fine. I know well enough that by that night that's going to fill up with some bloody fluid, some serosanguineous fluid, because nature abhors a vacuum. If there's an opening in there and I have to put in a drain or put in a wick or leave, just make the stitches real loose, same thing here. If you, if you escort God out of the building and you take away... God's truth and the lies of Satan may be introduced as new truth for a new day. If they don't believe God's word, which most people don't, they're going to believe something because we are made to worship. We are made to believe. Our society in this age of demonism ignores spiritual truth from the Bible, and we uh, live in a day of science and superstition at the same time. And we know a lot about the nature of the physical universe ways to explore the moon and ways to evaluate the sun. Uh, and yet our airways are flooded with psychics. Uh, you go up to Marstown right across from Lowe's. That lady's been there for years. I don't know. You know, it's got the, the sign on the door, ring three times, so I'll know you're there. You should know I'm there anyway. You're a psychic. You want my credit card number? You should know the, you should know the number already. You're a psychic. Can you, come on, lady. You know, either pucker up or duck. It's it. You, this is it. <laughs> 
Sister Rosa, or whatever her name is, is not somebody that I'm going to put any trust in. Uh, our airways are flooded with audiovisuals of psychics, really witches, occultists, and gullible people lining up at their door. I, I think there's no political problem in America we couldn't solve if we went to California and dug up Ronald Reagan. I love Ronald Reagan. But Nancy, Nancy Reagan was way off track when she was going to the astrologist and trying to figure out what was going to happen to her husband. Do you remember that in the 1980s? And I like Nancy Reagan. They're both in heaven now, I trust. But that was a foolish thing to get into. Modern man, I think I said this a minute ago, is both an intellectual giant and a spiritual and moral pygmy. We're in the intellectual graduate school and, again, uh, the moral kindergarten. Well, guess what? That's nothing new. It was true in Noah's day. Occultism, demonism, spiritism all abounded, and God put such behavior under a clear and verbalized curse. You can read about that in Leviticus 20, verse 6. All of this activity, speaking with the dead, necromancy, uh, Again, uh, spiritism, witches, the occult, psychics are outlawed and anathema to the word of God. If you're involved in that, don't. Just get out of that. Most of this, you say and I say, is anyway false and fake and ridiculous. And guess what? Most is not all. Some of that's real. Some of that is you don't need to be anywhere near a psychic activity or Ouija boards or something. You say, oh, that's most of that is silly. Well, most of it is silly. If a dog will bite you one times out of ten, most of the time you can get in the house okay. But one out of ten, are you going to live with that? Get your leg ripped off? That's not, that's not worth it. Some do indeed establish contact with evil spirits. You can read about that in the Bible with uh, Samuel and Saul. And some of these spirits do wield great power and share it with their dupes and their slaves. And finally, and again, this is just to get... Uh, a mood that, uh, that that world was in and our world is in, not only were they in a world of discovery, darkness, disbelief, and demonism, they were in a world of danger. This was very serious. Liberty was the great cry of that day and our day. People want not to be told what to do. They want freedom to do what they want, but soon they find they have no power to do as they ought. That's the problem. Uh, people are not Christian freedom is the freedom uh, to follow Christ and have a life that matters. The world's freedom is choosing which sin you want to get destroyed by. You're free to choose this sin or that sin. That's not freedom. That's different forms of slavery. To go to a blue penitentiary or a red jail cell is not freedom, even though you have choice. Both of the answers are wrong and they're bad. Uh, lawlessness was the consequence in that day. Rejecting God, they embraced chaos and people abandon all standards of right and wrong and the bible says about genesis 6 that they did that which was right in their own eyes uh, all the sexual rules for happiness in the bible one man one woman one life were thrown out then as they are thrown out now uh, marriage laws were thrown aside uh, indecency flooded society city streets were not safe for decent people I people, I, some people watch these YouTube videos all the time about little old ladies walking down the street and these teenagers going up and knocking them down. That makes me sick. Uh, that's absolutely wrong. The earth, Genesis 6, 11 says of that day, and it could point to our day, that the earth was filled with violence and the thoughts of men's heart were only evil continually in Genesis 6, 5. Well, now you have a choice. You live in a wicked day. I live in a wicked day. We can go along with it. We can get involved with it. We can try to run with it. Or we can stand up for God against it. What did Ham do? Well, not only we want to study where and when Ham lived, but whom Ham liked. You've had teenagers, and maybe your grandkids are headed toward that again. And you know the group that we hang out with is not only diagnostic, it's indicative of where our heart is, but it also directs where they end up because young people particularly are very, very influenced by their peer group. There were two kinds of people in that day. It wasn't as large of a population as it is now. My little five-year-old grandson, I'm so proud of him, he's learning math, and uh, his father asked him the other night, they had been talking about there's 8 billion people in the world. And he said, now what if there's a nice family and a baby's born in that family? He said, there's 8 billion and one people in the world. He, he knew the, the, the right answer to that. Well, in this day, there were not 8 billion people. There were Cain's kind of people, which were 
uh, the ungodly, they were involved in Cain and Abel, and Cain, you remember, was the murderer. After that, another family arose, Seth's family, through which the line of the seed would run. So there were basically ungodly people and godly people. Shazam, that's what we have now. Cain was the forerunner of the worldly, godless, secular crowd. They probably controlled the advertising of that day and the influence of that day. Seth, on the other hand, was the founder of the godly land line through which Noah and Ham and all these would run, into which they were born. A believing remnant, and it's always smaller, the ones that want to live for God, uh, sought fellowship with God and wanted to live with him. And John Phillips says it's almost like a little Gulf Stream in the ocean, just a little thread moving through uh, the great body of humanity that rejected and had no use for God. Noah's middle child, Ham, shared the interest of the ungodly. You can tell that by his behavior. People do what they want to do because they are who they are and they believe what they believe. That uh, ill habits gather by unseen degrees. Brooks run to rivers, rivers run to cease. You do what you do because you are what you are. And this is uh, the truth of their civilization in that day. Alexander White, a good expositor, painted this picture of Ham. There was the old vagabond to vice industrious among the builders of the ark. He had long been far too withered for anything called work and he got his weekly wages just for sitting over the pots of pitch and keeping the fires burning beneath them. It was of him that God had said that it grieved and humbled him at his heart that he'd ever made man. The black asphalt itself was whiteness itself beside the old reprobate's heart and life. And now Ham, Noah's second son, was never far away from that deep hollow out of which he prepared pitch, boiled and smoked. All day among the slime pits, all night, among the sultry woods, when you heard Ham's loud laugh, be sure it was a lewd old man singing a song there or telling a story. Now, some of that's made up, but the picture is of a wicked old worthless person. Ham's life and character proved that he gravitated more toward the haunts of the wicked than the gatherings of the godly in that day. And you know what? You can talk to a lot of people in uh, nightclubs or places like that and talk to them. I'm, I don't go to nightclubs, <laughs> thank good to see more, but I sew people's heads up that do, so you have a lot of time to talk, and you find out, uh, you may try to witness to them or say a kind word to them or redirect them, and a lot of them will say, oh, oh, oh Doc, you, you, just, you just take three steps back. Uh, my daddy was a Baptist preacher. I've been in church every time the door opens. You, you can't tell me anything I haven't heard. There's a man in my family, I told him, about uh, R.G. Lee's payday someday. What a wonderful message. He said, oh, I heard that a hundred times. I grew up in that area. And I thought, boy, I wish you hadn't said that. That's bad. A uh, ham said, like these old drunks that come to the ER to be dried out and sewed up, uh, ham had every spiritual advantage. Born into the home of godly parents, raised where the word of God was revealed, his throne implored his will supreme he had a wonderful beginning you'll be glad to know if you don't have a wonderful beginning god has a wonderful future for you if you'll trust him but you'll be sad to know that if you do have a wonderful beginning that doesn't guarantee anything family or religion doesn't save anybody uh, some children born into a christian home resent their parents strict standard uh, they were taught the gospel they said oh it's that same old nonsense again uh, children ruled sometimes by the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the world and its siren song appealed to them. Is that not, uh, don't raise your hands because it's embarrassing for all of us, but is that not true with some of our families? Uh, it sure has been for mine, people that, that are raised that way, that uh, feel like they're living a deprived life because their parents won't take them to do what the world's doing. And they could roll their eyes, oh, no, another camp, another day meeting, another thing like that. And mom and dad, then you grow up and you won't do what they like to do. And then everybody's very uncomfortable. Some of them end up traitors to the truth of God. Some of them end up rebels against the grace of God. Uh, wishing secretly they had been born into a fun home. <laughs> there was a family in our neighborhood that would always have a big party for football I mean and they were just out throwing stuff in the air and they had a bunch of people over there and loud music and 
And I thought, whoa, what a bunch of wackos. I'm not over with them. And I remember when my daughter saying, I wish we could have fun like that. <laughs> I said, and I said, no, you'll learn later. And she did. Uh, thank goodness that, that that is not fun. But at that point, they might be wishing secretly that they had been put into somewhere where there was less restraints. Ham was like that. He, in his heart, was attracted more to the people of the Canaanites than the Sethites, and they were a lot more fun to be around, and they didn't waste their time going to church or Bible study or things like that. Those people were dull to him, boring and rigid. He wanted this more liberated, free life. Number one, uh, where Ham and when Ham lived. Number two, whom Ham liked. Number three, this is the background against which he made his life choices. What Ham learned. According to the Bible, Ham's father, Noah, was a preacher of righteousness. Uh, the eyes of a holy God are too pure to look upon sin. Uh, that's the idea. Sin is an offense against his laws. The throne of God would topple from heaven if he ever said, oh, don't worry about it, it's okay, to any form of unrighteousness or violation of the standard for our lives. God, by his nature, must acknowledge and uh, identify and punish sin, and the penalty for sin is death. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court would vote 7 to 3, or 7 to 2, excuse me, or 6 to 3 or something like that, that this was cruel and unusual punishment. Guess what? They're not the Supreme Court. That's the problem. Uh, somebody else is supreme. God does, must, and will punish sin. The penalty is always death. Sin equals death. Sin equals death. I remember hearing John Phillips teach a lesson on the Old Testament where the uh, smoke on the altars of a thousand altars rose into the sky and every one of them that sacrifice placed there in, 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 in lieu of our being put on the sacrifice, special fire, was a, an, a reminder that sin equals death, sin equals death, sin equals death. Noah warned his generation that their world had become so corrupt that God was now sick that he'd ever made it and God was preparing to step onto the stage of human history just like we're gonna have in our main sermon today as Mark moves into the book of the Revelation. God's going to step back onto the seat and the throne of human history. Um, we talked about that, you know, God's wrath and God's mercy are in contradistinction. And right now, the furious waters of God's wrath are beating against the dam of God's mercy. And one day, that dam will give way, and the flood will fall, and the fire will come, and the, the punishment will happen. With a voice of thunder, Noah would say to that day, he was the preacher that day, Flee from the wrath to come. You want to clean out a modern liberal church? Preach on flee from the wrath to come. Uh, John the Baptist, what was his message? Repent. Jesus said repent, which is pretty much a kind of fleeing. You're turning away. You're going the other way. That's the idea. Uh, Mark told that story about driving home J. Harold Smith, and I told last week about used to give money to this radio program, and it's off the radio now because even the Christian radio does not want flee from the wrath to come. And again, Robert G. Lee, if you ever haven't heard him preach payday someday, you should. Just go to Google. You can find it and download it. Uh, I mean, that is a bone-chilling, heart-wrenching message about Ahab and his wife. Uh, that's the idea. What Ham learned from his father, the finest preacher of the day, one of the probably the only real preacher of the day, he learned that since man is uh, absolutely incapable of producing the desired righteousness, God has to, to make a way where righteousness of another person could be received by faith. And the idea that you trust that provision that God was making for our sins yet to come in that day was to go on the ark and avoid the wrath that God was rightly sending upon the world. Noah could have said, just like Paul said, there is none Righteous, no, not none. There is none that doeth good, not one. Uh, you say, I'm not sure about that. Well, you're wrong. Uh, turn your computer on when you get home. Mark it down. Man has a venomous tongue, a violent temper, vile taste, vicious tendencies. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You say, I don't believe it. Well, then you've lit a, you have led a pretty sheltered life is all I can say. And you can take it from those in here who haven't, from uh, law enforcement or the 
legal business or medical business or places like that. This is just the truth of, real of the reality of human nature. No doubt Noah used the story of Cain and Abel, still fresh in the minds of men, to show that salvation is not earned by human merit. What did uh, Abel do? Abel was going to sacrifice the sheep. Cain said, oh, you don't need to do that. Just give some vegetables to God. Shine them up. Uh, make them look good. We'll give him the best of whatever we can generate in our garden and we can decorate in our garden. And God said, no, sin equals death and you need to substitute. Those skins that they wore in the book of Genesis mean that an animal had to be killed and a substitutionary death had to be made. And every bit of the Old Testament a temple and tabernacle, Levitical laws for the substitution of somebody in your place were pictured by a lamb and a bird and all these different animals, but they pointed to the final lamb to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. They looked forward through the uh, representations of that day and putting their faith in God's provision for our sin. Just like we, or I, at least I did in 1985, look backwards to the provision that God made on the cross of the final lamb of God to be my substitute to take my wrath and to give me his righteousness. This is a great substitution. He would have said to his family, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. We're not saved by works of righteousness. He would go to Isaiah and say all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. He said God will count faith as righteousness in Romans 1 and 2. He will accept faith uh, pointing toward a substitute for us. That will provide the righteousness we need. Our righteousness is required and it is connected to our belief in God's provision of what the theologians call an alien righteousness outside of our life. That's the idea. In Ham's day, faith in God was demonstrated uh, by getting up and getting in that ark. God said, you know, I'm going to show you how you can follow me and have safety and not be drowned and dead with this wicked generation. People that followed God and believed God and put their faith in God and acted on it would be free from death, only they would receive salvation of that day, acknowledging their lost condition and deliberately believing and receiving and accepting the salvation God provided. Noah preached a gospel of substitution and somebody else generating safety. What if he said, all of you need to work hard and start building baskets and maybe trying to make boats? I'm, I'm not very good at making things. If I made a boat, it would sink before it got past the, the dock. It would not do it. I would, I would not have that chance. But Noah was directed by God to build an ark to the saving of his people. In his day, the ark was a symbol. We point men and women to Christ, God's ark of the safety now in reality. We talk about the reality. Noah was far too good a preacher to stop there. He'd let, know, he'd let people know that a changed life, trusting God and obeying him and looking toward that substitute and asking him to give you a new heart and a new life, is uh, the mark of that is a changed life and a changed love. You're not saved by a changed life or a changed love. You're saved by believing in God who is making a provision for your sin. But when he does that, he also gives you a new life that is seeable and touchable and tangible. And we can know something's happened to you. The believing man or woman will loathe what they used to love and love what they used to loathe. Righteousness by this new life that God was offering uh, us very clearly and to the Old Testament believers in shadows and pictures that we're going to project forward to Christ, that kind of life must be re reproduced in, in man or woman also. Righteousness is reproduced in the person that trusts God. Saving belief is a belief that behaves because you have a new life. You're not saved by behaving. You're not saved by your actions, but those actions will give an infallible mark that something is different in your life. So Ham and Noah came along, son and father, and you know what? No, Ham was right. He heard hundreds of messages from his dad. And, and in, in reality, that is hard for you. You think this is just dad. You know how that, <laughs> I'm a dad. <laughs> I'll say something, you can see your kids going, well, that's just dad. No, well, no, some of the things I say are just dad, like I, I might have said yesterday, Tennessee's going to beat the fire out of Kentucky. That's just dad. He's wrong. But, but in, uh, in this matter, 
because it's biblical, that's right. As the end of the age drew near, signs of the times began to multiply. Noah's voice became more urgent. He said, the time is running out. The time is running out. They're laughing in the back of the, of the building. They said, you said that a hundred years ago. My grandfather heard you say that. Shut up, old man. He said, the time is growing close. Flee to the ark. Flee from the wrath to come. Believe what God is doing. Noah's voice is more urgent. And guess what? By a miracle, Ham listened. In Genesis 7:13, it says, In the self same day entered Noah, Shem, Ham, which is a surprise, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his son into the ark. I would have thought, you would have thought, that Ham would have said no. And Ham was not a dynamic Christian after this. But at the point that it mattered, he believed and, and took advantage of God's provision and entered the ark. I think they were stunned too. I don't know if he wrote a book called Spare or something when he went in because he was mad at the other brothers. But anyway, that's what he did. <laughs> at the end of the age, Noah's voice became more urgent. Ham walked up that uh, gangplank. Guess what? Nobody pushed him. Nobody pulled him. Nobody's going to push you up that gangplank, and nobody's going to pull you up that gangplank. That is God's provision. You can go into it deeply spiritual and trusting and affected by what God's doing in your life, or you can just make the right decision and go. Uh, but in this matter, he very clearly did what God said had to be done. God convicts, but he doesn't coerce. Salvation is a choice always, and his choice was, even though he wasn't much of a person, and neither were we, and neither are we, God's made provision, and we can go into that ark. He didn't go in with a uh, 100% on fire heart, though. He went in, unfortunately, and took with him, like we all do, I guess, the world, the flesh, and the devil, at least our response to them. Ham's motivation for entering the ark was fear. Guess what? He entered the ark. In your life, in my life, if you are saved because you're scared to go to hell, guess what? You're saved. That is not the best motive, but it is an effective motive. And if love won't do it or reason won't do it, maybe fear will do it. Either way, come to Christ in that day. Come to the ark, the picture of Christ in that day. Alone, it doesn't produce, however, a very robust faith. We're going to see that. What Ham had learned from his father, and it finally worked, he did enter the ark. Next, what Ham lost? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.15 that some will be saved, though, as by fire. The Bible is full of such examples. What are the days, our days going to be like before the end times? Days of Noah, days of Lot. Lot wasn't much of a Christian either, and we're not either. I don't, I'm always afraid lightning bolt's going to hit me when I say that. But he ended up discouraged and disgusted and shameful, and it just didn't do very well. Lot stepping out by faith with his uncle Abraham to leave the land where they live and to go into God's promised land was a good act of faith. That starts off well, but like Solomon, even though he started off well, he didn't end well. When you see Lot in the end, he is drunk and dishonored, to say the least, on the hills near the smoking ruins of Sodom. It is a sad picture, but he never lost his salvation. You say, are you sure? I'm not sure. I would say he probably did lose his salvation, but the Bible says just a lot. So he was justified. He is an example, unfortunately, like we can be sometimes of people with a saved soul but a lost life. Uh, were it not for the comment in Second Peter 2, 7, uh, 2, 7 and 8 that uh, he was saved, we wouldn't believe it. He was saved, though, as by fire. And the same that was true for Lot was true for Ham. He was saved. He entered the ark. You can comb the Bible and comb his life for any evidence of any victory or any uh, spiritual living, and you won't find it. He absolutely uh, was a rough old person. I think I told you about this person I treated one time. He was an old bachelor farmer. Bachelor farmers are sour people lots of time. That may be why they're bachelors. Maybe women don't want anything to do with them. But anyway, he, he was dying of colon cancer, and I got convicted. I needed to talk to him, and I wasn't very happy about it because he was not very fun to talk to. And I, and I don't remember his name. I'm just making this up. I said, Bob, you're going to die, and you're getting close. I mean, there, he was, could not have surgery. We had him on hospice. And 
do you need to make sure you're going to heaven? I said, if, if you went to heaven's gate and, and they ask you why they should let you in, what would you say? And he got up in his bed and spit that head tobacco all around the bed. We just couldn't even keep it clean. He spat that out and got right up in my face. He said, I'd say that I trusted Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can get in, you idiot. And I said, well, that's what I thought too. God bless you. See you in heaven. <laughs> he said, how do you think I'd get in? There's only one way. Dad blamed doctors, a bunch of idiots. <laughs> and I thought, okay. <laughs> well, at least it worked out. <laughs> um, Ham disc discredited his father one of the greatest Old Testament saints, and the worst sin he ever commend, commit, commended that, that he did was because of uh, what he did with his father. We talked about just a minute ago, uh, Ephesians 6, you should honor your father and mother. Exodus 20, honor your father and mother, that thy days be long upon the earth and the land the Lord thy God giveth thee. That's the idea. Uh, nothing but the vast, incomparable, wonderful grace of God could have got him into heaven because he sure didn't deserve it any more than you and I did. Let me read you about this story about how he dishonored his father, and it changed the course of history. Every branch point at this point in Genesis was a, involved a pretty big lot of people because it was so far back. The 8 billion people that are alive today are all descendants of either Ham, Shem, or Japheth. There's no way around that. So this is very serious, anything that happens to those lines. Uh, Genesis 9, verse 20 says, And Noah began to be a husbandman. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not spin this, that sounds bad. I'm going to paint this as friendly as I can to Noah. Noah was a husbandman. He planted a vineyard. All right, we went on a bus trip one time to Napa Valley and all those places across the bay from San Francisco that have beautiful grapes. And those grapes are beautiful, and they, they're tasty. And maybe if you leave them out in the backyard for a while and let them uh, ferment a little bit, then maybe Noah didn't know that. Maybe he just thought they were just tastier than ever. <laughs> uh, and planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken. Well, maybe he didn't know the... See, I'm trying to be nice to know. Maybe he didn't know the, the, uh, the doses of it or how much you were to put in to mix the water and the fermented juice of the grape. This was too much because it says, and was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. Well, maybe he was just trying to go to bed, and he just got a little bit short of the bed after his clothes were off before he could get in the bed, and he fell down. And maybe he could have woken up the next day, and everything would have been all right. But unfortunately, his sons came in, and there's Dad lying there, drunk as Cooter Brown, <laughs> and just as and, and face down, and uh, or face up, I don't know, naked on the floor. This is not good. He was uncovered within his tent. Ham said, oh, my dear, we must help poor old dad. No, it says, and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and went out and told his brothers about it. He said, hey, elder son and younger son, guess who's in there, the one that is the preacher of righteousness. Oh, boy, he was just happy as he could be to make fun of his dad. That's not good. That's not going to get you long life, according to the promise of God. Uh, Shem and Japheth, God bless them, somebody cared about their dad, took a garment, laid it upon their shoulders, and went backwards and covered dad. That was nice. That way they didn't have to think, oh, this is very embarrassing the rest of his life. Their faces were backward. They saw not their father's nakedness. Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his younger son had done unto him. Uh, it says younger, and what that means there, uh, John Philip says, is younger than the youngest one. Or no, the younger than the oldest one, because I, I wondered about that too. Uh, he said, cursed be Canaan. Canaan is Ham's son. So this is the downstream from Ham. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Uh, there's a great blessings promised to Shem and Japheth, but there is cursing on the line of Ham because of this wickedness they did to their father. He said, Cursed be Canaan, that is Ham's line, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, to make it clear, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. There is a division here on how you treated your father. And his father was not, he shouldn't have gotten drunk. But again, I don't know that they had any fermentation clubs back then to try to figure out how to do things. He may not have meant to do this, but even if he did, you've got to take care and honor your father. God shall enlarge Japheth, he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So either way, uh, older brother or younger brother, now... Ham's family, Canaan, is going to be their servant. So that's not good. That's not nearly as much blessing as on the other two. 
a shame on Noah's laps, but when Shem and Japheth heard about their father's sad condition, they walked in tactfully and tried not to embarrass him. The two men uh, that came in and did the right thing had drunk deeply of the grace of God. They knew something about the compassion of Christ. Righteousness was reproduced. And again, we don't have everything about Ham's life, but there's n no sign of that. There had to be some or he wouldn't have been saved, but there wasn't anything that we can remember. Uh, Ham had no such scruples. You know what Ham did? He looked and he laughed and he gloated. He went out to tell everybody he knew uh, that mom. When we were, uh, when our kids were little, I told them about movies. I said, G was good, PG might be pretty good, but R is rotten. They, they, that was my, my system, don't watch the rotten ones. And you know what? They watched us like a hawk. They'd come in there and there'd be a movie on TV. My, they'd say, is that an R movie? I said, no, it's not an R movie. And they said, oh, you know, they're trying to catch you because you see if you are consistent with your rules. We, we know that he ran out to broadcast the news. Guess what? Love covers a multitude of sins. There was no love here because there was no covering or respect for this uh, godly man Noah by his crude son Ham. We don't know else what Ham did. But the inference is that Canaan was involved too. They didn't say Ham this time. They said Canaan. Maybe he went out and got his son. He said, hey, guess who's in here? Go, granddad. You know the one that points a finger at you? Well, guess what? He's not pointing any fingers right now. Ah, go tell everybody. Charge a quarter to put, let him in under the back tent or something. That's great. All we know is that a short time later, with the flood tide of inspiration on him, Noah soundly cursed Canaan in Genesis 9, 20 through 27. The severity of the curse and the fact that it doesn't have Ham's name and it's got... Canaan's name means something worse than a, than a mocking look. They must have really made fun. Noah blessed Japheth. Noah blessed Shem. He looked at Ham and then what Ham had not done to protect him, and he turned away. The silence was deafening. I think all those three boys are right there when Noah pronounced these cursings on everybody. In, either, in any way, Ham lost the blessing of God. There would be enlargement, and this is another message for Japheth, there would be enlightenment for Shem. There would be nothing for Ham. He went through life, and this was very important in the Old Testament, in cattle and land and in, in uh, position in society. He went through life uh, unblessed and unrewarded, a saved soul, but an impoverished life. And he's only a saved soul because we can find it in the Bible. There's no evidence to us. To miss the blessing of God is a terrible loss for the child of God. God promised blessings for his people, but most of those blessings are an if-then proposition. For example, Exodus 20, verse 12, we've been talking about this. It says, Honor thy father and mother, that thy days be long upon the land which the Lord thy God give thee. You don't get to be have the land which the Lord thy God give thee and a long life unless you honor your father and mother. And then, if, then. And also, Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 that I quoted. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, this is the promise, and thou mayest live long on the earth, if then, if then. If any man like wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally, upbraideth not, it shall be given him. You want wisdom? If then. You say, I have no wisdom, I need it. God says, I know that, you sure do, I'll give it to you. You've come to the right person. If then, if then. The greatest blessing God has for us and would have had for him back then is to increase our capacity for Christ for all eternity, to help us develop into godly men and women that will be prepared to have a role in the millennium and also to enjoy the worship and the life and the forever of God's kingdom. Conclusion, Ham didn't end up much good. Guess what? Ham didn't start out any good. He was saved by the skin of his teeth, but he was saved, and the Bible is very clear to point away from his life and his activity and I'm glad it did save but literal practical sanctification his main activity seemed to fill his diapers and to stink things up was about the main thing he did out next to and this is John Phillips next to an out and out center there is no more dreadful person than a sad old black backsliding believer you know what in a way it's better to be and don't take this in eternal sense it's better to be lost if you're going to be lost because you're 
you might as well be out and out lost and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season because you're going somewhere where you'll never have any more pleasure. But if you're saved and you refuse to follow Christ, then you don't get any of the joys of following Christ. You're betwixt and between. You're just like the guy that swallowed an egg. If I move, it'll break. If I sit, it'll hatch. What do I do? You know, he just doesn't know what to do. <laughs> the most miserable man on the face of the earth is not the lost man, but the saved man out of practical fellowship with God. He can't enjoy the sin. God won't let him, and he can't, he, he's chosen not to fully follow Christ, where there would be joy there. That's the idea. Last verse, 1 Corinthians 9, 27 is for us. I keep my body, bring it under subjection, lest by any means what I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That is not losing your salvation. That is being a worthless person, a derelict, a wreck that is very ineffective, and you don't want to go in front of God and him just say, well, come on in, but... Boys, better watch out. This one's a stinker. He's absolutely no good. May we never end up practically useless for the work of God, even though God in mercy made provision for us in Christ, and we're glad he did. Father, thanks for uh, this lesson on wonderful Noah. What a great man. He wasn't perfect and a terrible example. Ham, help us to try to be more like Noah and to not walk. And, and like we all have in the past, help us not walk like Ham. Help us walk wisely. Amen.